We're going to talk about signing and Dominican Sue here in just one second. First, though, if you have not subscribed to the Thomas Mott Show, you're missing out. Over 6,000 of you guys have done it in the first two months here. I greatly appreciate that. If you like what I do, talking about the National Football League, talking about the Philadelphia Eagles, go down below and hit that red subscribe button. Give the show a thumbs up as well. It always helps the show grow, and that's kind of the goal here on the Thomas Mott Show. <laughs> What's up, guys? Thomas Mott here. Welcome to the Thomas Mott Show on a Wednesday. A lot of people are still frustrated about the Monday Night Launch, and rightfully so. I, however, am trying to move on and better this football team. That way, the 8-1 and Eagles can stay atop the NFC East and hopefully still be in a really good contention for a Super Bowl win. And you really need to look at the one big flaw of Monday Night, the one reason why they lost. No, not the non no call in the face smack penalty. No, not two of those bad fumbles back by possessions. No, it was the run defense. The run defense is the one flaw of this Eagles. It's truly, like, the one issue right now in Philadelphia is the fact that the interior defensive line, without Jordan Davis, is getting run over by the Houston Texans two weeks ago, and you saw it by the Washington Commanders on Monday Night Football. And so to do that, they got to go make a move, right? They have to go ahead and try and make a move, sign a player to hopefully either, you know, fill in the gap while Jordan Davis is out or maybe help Jordan Davis whenever Jordan Davis comes back because this is the one flaw that I think could hurt them, especially in a deep playoff run. And who better to sign than the only really good player left in the market right now, and that is Ndamukong Sue. And you're saying, Thomas, you've talked about Ndamukong Sue before. You said so on a show last week. You don't want Ndamukong Sue. And I didn't at that point. And then I watched what the Texans did, and then I watched what the Commanders did, and then I looked at the schedules. We'll see coming up in the next four weeks. You are playing really good running backs and really good rushing teams. And honestly, I've changed my mind. I think they desperately need a Dominican suit. What blows my mind, though, is one, how bad Fletcher Cox has been so far the past couple of weeks, and two, how can Ndamukong Sue actually be a free agent? Because you look at the numbers from last year, it doesn't make sense. Look at this. This is 2021, okay? Now, he's old. He was drafted in 2010. He's been here for over 11 years. It's a long career. He's not an every-down guy at D-tackle, but last year, he still was able to. Look at this. He still was able to play 17 games. He had six sacks, he had 27 tackles, and he had 13 quarterback hits. Six sacks, that's way more than Fletcher Cox is on pace for right now this year. I just don't understand why he is available, and I think the only reason is one of two. One, he does have young kids, he has twin boys. Maybe he's, you know, thinking about being done with the National Football League because he's made a ton of money. I mean, so much money throughout his career. Or two, he wants too much money. And maybe Philadelphia has called and they said, hey, and now again, you come on, we'll give you $2 million this year. And he goes, how about six? And Howie Roseman goes, we don't have $6 million, Sue. Like, we, uh, we we can't give you $6 million. It's the only way that makes sense as to why he remains unsigned because Philadelphia's not the only team that needs help on the interior defensive line. The Chargers need help on the interior defensive line. You can make some arguments for other NFL or NFC and AFC teams. I do think, though, signing him would greatly help, if not just for the next couple of weeks, right? If not just, just for a couple of weeks here to kind of plug the hole that is left by Jordan Davis. And Jordan Davis coming back, let's say, three weeks from now, doesn't guarantee he's going to be 100% either. And that's something to really focus in on. I mean, he's going to come back, but that's a pretty tough ankle sprain for a really big guy. I'm not expecting him to just waltz back in there and be 100%. It's going to take a couple more weeks after coming back, hence why I think signing Sue makes a ton of sense. Another reason, just mentioned it, Fletcher Cox has not been very good. He's had to play a lot more without Jordan Davis, and the production has been way, way, way down. Look at this Bleeding Green Nation article, which gives you the snap count percentage of everybody on Monday night. Fletcher Cox was up there. He played 70 snaps. That's 84% of the defense. That is more than anybody else on the defensive line. I mean, the only other people that played more snaps were the safeties and the secondary players who, of course, play every single snap. So he's playing a bunch, but he's not productive at all. Listen to this quote. Fletcher Cox played his highest snap count percentage of the season, 84%. His previous high was 75% against the Cowboys in Week 6. Cox logged seven total tackles against the Commanders, and three of them were solo. But he had no sacks, no TFLs, no quarterback hits. In his last six games, Cox has no sacks, one tackle for loss, and two quarterback hits. He's played 299 snaps in this stretch. Just not what you're looking for from a guy who's making top 10 interior defensive line money after being cut and re-signed to a one-year $14 million deal. Widening the sample size in his last 27, Cox has six and a half sacks, nine tackles for loss, and 19 quarterback hits. For perspective, Cox had 10 and a half sacks, 12 tackles for loss, and 34 quarterback hits in 16 games played in 2018 alone. He's clearly not the same player he once was. It isn't surprising given all the snaps he's logged in his career. Jordan Davis being out is trying to Cox to play even more than he should be playing, and he's falling, failing to make an 
impact. And that, again, is very important to go ahead and note that he is just not making an impact on the defensive line. Now, he's not going to be an eagle after this year. You can make an argument, Brandon Graham, Robert Quinn. This defensive line is going to take a massive, massive change this offseason, hence why they should draft Jordan or uh, uh, the guy from Alabama. But at the same time, you need someone to help out with the production, and Milton Williams is not able to do it, and hence why I really think Andamakan Sue makes a ton of sense. You guys think Andamakan Sue would be a good player for the Eagles to sign, or am I crazy? I would love to hear from you guys. I read every single comment. I mean, believe it or not, I do read. I try to reply to a lot of them, too. So if you guys want to go ahead and give me your thoughts, go down below, and I would, uh, I'm would. i going to read it and see, see what you guys think. Okay, there's an update on Dallas Goddard's shoulder timeline and comparing it to a previous injury for a different player. We'll get to that in just one second. First, though, if you guys feel good about the Eagles bouncing back after that loss on Monday Night Football, how about a DraftKings promo for the Colts game? You see here on TFM, the link will be down below in the description box. If you bet $5 on the Eagles, you get $200 if they win. It's very, very simple. All you do is you sign up by clicking here. You'll see it on the TFM website. Sign me up. Register and deposit $5 plus bucks. Then place a $5 plus money line bet on the next Eagles game, which is Sunday against the Colts. Get back $200 if they win. That's $200 in addition to your winnings. So really great promo here. Ooh, I almost lost my laptop. Really great promo here. Uh, if you guys want to jump in on that with DraftKings, it will be down below in the description box. Okay, let's move over here to a quick update, a brief update on the tight end situation just to kind of give you a better time frame because we don't necessarily have a full, I mean, really a full indication of what the injury is. They have not, the Eagles have not said he has a this shoulder injury or he tore that or that. We don't know. And so there was an interesting update by Mark uh, Garofalo and by, or Garfolo, excuse me, and a, uh, a BGN radio interview with a doctor who has a little write-up here on Bleeding Green Nation. Quote, Dallas Goddard, according to Mike uh, Garofalo, Goddard will miss extended time with a shoulder injury. It's a very broad term to use, but by video that appears to be a 2021 T. Higgins-type shoulder injury, another possibility based on video is a C sprain. Spring. From now, for now, the expectation should be without Goddard for two to four weeks. Uh, and, of course, they previously uh, interviewed Dr. Edwin Porras, I think, on Bleeding Green Nation. So we, we, we don't know. We don't know how long this is going to be. Is it a shoulder? Is it, or is it an AC sprain? Is it a joint thing? Is it a you know tear, a tendon? I have no idea. I am not a doctor. But I do know the next couple of weeks without him are going to be very interesting. And two to four weeks does make a difference. If it's two weeks, you're missing the Colts and the Packers game. That's it. And it's a Sunday nighter against Green Bay. If you're missing three weeks, you miss Colts, Packers, and Tennessee Titans. Titans are good right now. You miss four weeks, and you're missing Colts, Packers, Titans, and Giants. And listen, the Bears was supposed to be just an easy rollover game. Chicago's defense is bad, but they're still playing very, at least much better than they have been the past couple of weeks. Then you have Dallas and the Saints and the Giants again. It's going to be very interesting with two players out, Jordan Davis and Dallas Goddard, to see how long they're going to be out and how much of an impact that's going to be over what is the hardest stretch right now of this Eagles schedule. If, if they lose a couple games, not the end of the world. You got to remember with the current standings, New York is, you know, game in a, really a game out of first place in the NFC East. The Vikings are a half a game back. That number one seed could slip away. And heck, if Philadelphia lost enough, they could lose the division and be a five seed. And then you got to go on the road. And you do not want that if you are the Eagles. So thumbs up if you hope Dallas Goddard comes back soon. I think he will. It's just a matter of how bad is it. And on a Wednesday, after a Monday game, we still don't have like full on details, at least as of filming this early on a Wednesday morning. Uh, let's wrap up here uh, with the NFL.com Power Rankings. We always do this here after a week of football. It's interesting to see who remains at number one, Philadelphia. Yes, they lost, but how about NFL.com? I'm not bumping us down. I appreciate that. They say, quote, the Eagles were overdue for a bad game. It's a fair classification of Monday night's uh, 32-21 stumble to the commanders of the link. Philly's first loss of the season included four turnovers and a crushing late hit penalty against Brandon Graham. However unsatisfying the call might have been, they go on to say the defense held its own despite all these extra snaps, but the offense wasn't sharp enough when opportunities arrived. A frustrating loss for sure, but the Eagles remain the top team in the NFC with inside track to the number one seed, basically saying they control their own destiny as they do. Chiefs at number two, that's due to the fact that Buffalo has now lost two in a row and they have fallen out of the top three. Minnesota, whether you like Minnesota or not, they've had a lot of close games. It was an impressive win against the Bills, even though they should have lost on Sunday, but you've got to put them there at eight and one. Then you have the Miami Dolphins followed by the Buffalo Bills. And this is fair, right? But in, in the past, they had the Dolphins behind the Bills because the Dolphins had beaten them, but Buffalo looked better. Not anymore. Dolphins had the head-to-head, -head, and Buffalo has looked rough over the past couple of weeks. And honestly, Josh Allen went from maybe MVP frontrunner to now really falling back, especially the late-game performance, you know, the fumble in the end zone. Interception in overtime when you already had a field goal. It's, he's a great player, and Buffalo's still very dangerous. Their inability to run the ball, though, is... You just got to say what it is. It's rough. It's not a good look for Buffalo, and it scares you if you're a, B a Buffalo Bills fan. 
as you're getting into the playoffs. Baltimore quietly back into the top 10. They sneak in there at number six. A little bit of a fall there. Again, the defense is still a question mark, but you, the Ravens are rightfully in the top 10. San Francisco, I think one of the biggest threats to Philadelphia in the NFC. They're seven. Dallas is eight, despite that loss. Can't blow double digit lead. Sorry, Cowboys. It stinks. I'm sorry. Got to hope Dallas loses on Sunday. That would be really big if Dallas loses another one to get to 6-4. and four. Tennessee, again, interesting football team. Don't get a lot of hype right now, but they are a top-10 team at 9. And the Jets, the sneaky little Jets on a bye week. They fall one spot, but they stay there at number 10. Then you have the Bengals. Then you have the Bucks. Then you have the Giants, the Seahawks, and the New England Patriots. I'm a little worried about Tampa Bay and the Green Bay Packers, and I'm wondering where Green Bay is. Green Bay is 16 on this list. It feels like, you know, if you're an Eagle fan— you're worried about, obviously, the Vikings. You're worried about the Cowboys. You know, you're worried about the San Francisco 49ers. But aren't you a little worried about a hot Tom Brady coming to Lincoln Financial Field or a hot Aaron Rodgers coming to Lincoln Financial Field? That's Sunday night or two weeks from now against the Packers. Very good test for this Eagle team because the Packers aren't that good, but they've not really had, you know, success against Rodgers and then the future Brady in the past. And it'd be fun to see what they can do against a uh, improving, let's just say, Green Bay Packer team that had lost five in a row. Okay, plenty more coming up the next couple of days. I think I'm going to do a mock draft tomorrow. I want to take a look at where Philadelphia is in the top five and try and fix this defensive line with a Will Anderson or, you know, Jalen Carter or so, someone like that. Uh, we might do a mock draft tomorrow, so stay tuned for that one. Hit the notification bell. The notification bell. Apparently, a lot of people who watch this show are not subscribers, and a lot of my subscribers don't see this show because YouTube algorithm, it's so weird. And so if you guys want to actually watch the show, that's I figure why you subscribe. Go down below and hit that sub button with a little bell, a little bell ding just ding it uh and i would greatly appreciate that there you go there's your update thomas mott this is thomas mott show <laughs>